things go from here. It says, this is the last stupid question session of this season. So uh, I think everybody kind of has the feel for things at this point. These are casual conversations. Um, just trying to make sure that we're sharing all the information that we have and get some expertise on some of the murkier subjects. Um, so uh, pretty open format for today. And you know, feel free to add questions to the chat or raise your hand and chime in as things come up for everybody. Um, today we're going to be discussing formerly uncommon, recently more and more common insect pests of apples, um, particularly woolly apple aphid and European apple sawfly had come to mind, but um, kind of expecting to see if there are some other options that, that also come to people's minds as we chat. Um, today, uh, we're going to, we're joined by Art Agnello and Chris Berg, and hopefully Doug Pfeiffer will be joining us as well. Um, we'll kind of be helping lead and shape this discussion. So thank you for your time today. So I think the first question that I have for the both apple aphid and European apple sawfly in particular are what resonates with you as insect pests that are really starting to change their dynamics in apple orchards and you know what patterns have you seen with those? Well, not no. Yeah, why don't you go ahead, uh, Chris? I know you're you're pretty specialized per, specialized on woolly apple aphid problems. Well, okay, I can do that. Uh, so down this way, our woolly apple aphid problem, if you will, began in the year 2000, which was the year I began with Virginia Tech. And there was a massive regional outbreak of woolly apple aphid that year. And in hindsight, the people who had been in the business here for a lot longer than I came to the conclusion, I think, that the loss of PENCAP-M in 19, or methylparathion in 1999 was probably under the Food Quality Protection Act, was probably largely associated with that based on its broad spectrum activity, including against woolly apple aphid, but also toxicity to the native natural enemies of woolly apple aphid. And so in the absence of PENCAP-M, there was nothing uh, to preclude the buildup of woolly apple aphid and nothing to stop that buildup, um, you know, the, based on disruption of the biocontrol agents. So my experience was that, and that's where I really first got interested in woolly apple aphid because of the extent of the issue that year, to some extent the following year, but our observations were that within just a couple of years, um, the biocontrol agents had reestablished adequate, um, certainly suppression or re regulation of the pest. And it went along at kind of historically low levels through about 2000, and 10, and then brown marmorated stink bug broke out, and growers, in the absence of really a lot of information about what to do against stink bug, jumped on the harshest, broadest spectrum insecticides available, which often included, uh, you know, pyrethroid applications in the post bloom period, as well as carbamate, such as uh, lanate, for example. And those things incited woolly apple aphid populations again. And they hadn't really been a problem since 2000, 2001, at least in this area. They're always there. They're basically ubiquitous. And according to Mark Brown's work back in the 80s, and, and uh, you know, most apple trees in our area are infested with woolly apple aphid to some extent. Um, but... Um, and so woolly apple aphid became the number one secondary pest behind these broad spectrum uh, programs for brown marmorated stink bug. I would say since then, our experience here has been that um, A, growers have backed away from those programs because they know the effects of those programs on their, on their management um, strategies. 
And woolies haven't been nearly as much of an issue in recent years as they were in the years following the brown marmorated stink bug outbreak. So that's kind of the backstory of, of the situation here. What's your experience been, Art? Yeah, so I mean, I'll second uh, what you said about the impact of um, responding to in invasive pests like, you know, brown marmorated stink bug and uh, wh whatever else people have been, um, you know, worried about. Uh, particularly, BMSB has had uh, the, those those management programs have had a, a big role in disrupting the natural control of woolies. Uh, woolly apple aphid has never been easy to control. I mean, we've always had, as Chris said, uh, sort of a, an endemic um, presence uh, in, in all our orchards in New York, and um, they don't they don't show up, they show up unpredictably. Um, when they do, they're usually unanticipated and they're usually devastating. You know, the, we'll get calls, people just have, uh, you know, woolies dripping off the trees. Um, but uh, they, they are um, very effectively controlled under most situations by uh, Aphelanus mali, um, which, which also occur, you know, very, uh, reliably in our orchards. So we can't, you know, we, we run, we try to run, have run uh, woolly apple aphid trials in our research blocks. And um, I know it's difficult to keep a, a population going because, um, you know, the, we, we don't, we don't treat them the way that commercial uh, operations treat those, those trees. And uh, ultimately the, the uh, predators come in and they sorry, the parasitoids come in and uh, wipe them out. So it's tough to get a, a, a sort of a, a control um, uh, assessment, but it, it's almost always traceable to disrupting um, the uh, the natural control mechanisms in our experience. Um, and I don't know what it's been like in our in New York orchards over the past couple of seasons because uh, BMSB seems to have receded in, re in uh, importance in um, most commercial operations. And so growers are not, you know, hammering them with uh, quite so many uh, preventive, uh, protective sprays of things. And uh, so I would expect that, you know, the the incidence of woolly um, outbreaks is sort of uh, flagged somewhat, but uh, there are, un unfortunately, there are no really good rescue materials around, not many, we'll say, rescue materials around if you should find yourself in a position to need one. You know, the broad spectrum um, uh, insecticides don't do a great job. The um, uh, Lord's band's gone for what whatever uh, use that had as an early season preventive. Um, diazinon, most I don't even know if it's still labeled. It used to be labeled now only for woolies, but it may be gone entirely now. And most markets won't accept fruit that's been treated. And that diazinon was always the, the gold standard because it was such a massive hammer. <laughs> it was about the only thing uh, out there in the old, bad old days arsenal that would take care of woolies. And it probably shouldn't be used. You know, it's just, it's just a very disruptive chemical. Now, I know that uh, Monique, uh, Rivera is is interested in looking at some more uh, recent and yet to be sort of developed commercially uh, systemic type materials that that might um, just be you know uh, able to prevent infestations through preventive systemic treatments um, and would be very selective. But you know that and that's I think a, a good approach. So. That's sort of what uh, some of what I know about the situation in New York. I have a, a follow up question actually to what Art just said, if that's okay to jump in, um, which would be I think so diazinon is still labeled for, for Wallies. And to be perfectly honest, I'm going to say that whenever I go to a grower, which is happening more and more often recently, and they say they have a big Wally problem, that would be my number one recommendation to them is sort of like grit your teeth and say, you're probably going to need to come in hard with diazinon for a year. But that said, is there another option that I could or should be telling them in the interim before kind of Monique's research and new products come out. Um, one, of the last products, one of the other products that's been touted as effective is Movento. 
or spirotetramat, and that's typically applied mm, once the foliage is on the trees, maybe, you know, petal fall time, time frame. And its nature, you may, may know, is that it has sort of two-way systemicity in, in that it moves up to the, uh, the leaves and the shoots, as well as down to the roots where resident populations of woolies can provide the inoculum for the annual infestation of the arboreal parts of the tree. That um, application is basically prophylactic because you don't know to what extent you're going to be dealing with woolly apple aphid later on that season because the populations of woolies don't really start to become problematic if they're going to until June. And, and certainly peak in June and maybe the early part of July is, is typical but there have been instances of them peaking even as late as midsummer too. Generally speaking, it's thought that woolies subside of their own accord in the heat of midsummer, but that's not always true, um, especially if they get really going early on. So, you know, Movento, uh, yeah, it's, I, I think some people like Diane uh, Alston out in Utah and maybe Betsy Beers at Washington State have had some experience with it and, seem to have shown some decent results. Um, but the problem is it's a very expensive application. And so to use that product prophylactically early in the season, um, given its cost, is something that I always caution growers about. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly right. I, I uh, completely agree with that. And in, in the last few um, you know seasons that I was counseling growers, it, it would be sort of uh, with that proviso. So if you if you if you think you may be having or be going to have a problem with woolly apple if it's this season, based on what you saw last season or a previous season, you really need to get out and do a preventive thing before you actually know that it's going to be warranted. And you know, uh, in New York, we we don't start to see the first aerial colonies until early June, maybe, and. Um, if you can possibly, you know, make uh, a determination sort of before that, be out there and, and intensively looking at the trees and the, the succulent tissue, tissue, the shoots that are that are uh, in a uh, an orchard with a history, and you start to see them, uh, yeah, petal fall, post petal fall spray um, is probably your best, um, you know, sort of protective option. Although, as Chris says, you might end up be just tossing those those dollars into the wind because they may not show up. But it, it's a tough position for a grower to be in. Yeah. I and, jump and, a little bit so, with my, you know, New England perspective here, too, um, which is that, you know, we, we don't usually see big outbreaks of, of woolly aphids. Uh, most of the guys up here are not using pyrethroids, and you know, luckily so far we've we've not had a lot of of marmorated stink bug um, to to disrupt the system. Uh, but we see kind of a low level that my the sort of rumor is that the delegate is it might be something that's also knocking out some key um, predators, and we're at kind of a point of you know, what's the threshold? Do we do something or not? You know, definitely not worth anything as, as expensive as, as Movento. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, I've, I have orchards that haven't seen a pyrethroid in 20 or 30 years that do have moderate woolly, apel, woolly aphid outbreaks. And so it's kind of, you know, monitoring thresholds and then also the, the control question. Um, so, so when you say moderate populations, Kathleen, what's the what's the upshot of that ultimately? I mean, so so thinking about what woolies can do to an orchard, um, well, they can if and really this is really if they get away from you and establish those massive colonies that coalesce along shoots and they're just dripping with wool and pumping out crawlers and pumping out honeydew. So, so you can have the honeydew on the fruit, um, which is a cosmetic thing. You can have, you know, honeydew and therefore sooty mold. You can have, under those circumstances, um, splitting of the wood, galling. I don't know if it's a true gall, but it's 
looks like gall and splitting of the wood, which can is not a good thing from a horticultural perspective. It can, in severe cases, cause premature defoliation. And um, I've I've seen it in New Zealand actually reduce the crop load quite quite considerably. And the final thing I'll point to is that if the population is large enough in the fall during harvest, sometimes pickers will just rebel and, and revolt and say no because it's so it's sticky, it gets all over you, and they don't want to pick the fruit when the trees are in that kind of condition. So those are sort of to me the economic impacts and if. If you're not seeing those kinds of populations or impacts, I think that in most instances, if left to their own devices, and I've always said this, the biocontrol agents will do an adequate job of keeping them below problematic levels. Yeah, I think there is, you know, it, it's a lot paranoia about, you know, oh, they could get bad and stuff like that. I think the typical response is to use something like um, a sale, which has a you know, sort of slightly suppressive effect on them without really disrupting the rest of the of the system. Um, I know I've heard people, no, nobody who's uh, that I'm involved with, but I hear people in the Hudson Valley that are really complaining about them still and, and saying they've got, you know, major issues where you do see big aerial colonies, but that's not that's not typical to what I've I've seen. I would say, well, and sorry, I don't mean to Art, I'll shut up in a minute, but I don't I, I, I don't know that this is true, but I wonder if, and so can I share a screen just for a second? I have to ask Mike, I'm not sure. Give it a shot. shot and yeah, you should be good we'll to go, Chris. Figure it out. Okay, uh, let's see, where is it? Oh, my, see, share, no, I'm not sure. Oops. No. I don't seem to be able to. My computer's all messed up since I retired. They, they, um, so I can't apparently, I can't apparently access my screen. My my mm -hmm. I had a presentation that I had given before, modified a little bit with some photos that I thought you might like to see. But unfortunately, I can't access it. Um, so where was I going with that? You know, one wonders whether warmer winters are associated with less mortality, whether there are some aphids that are overwintering above ground, like in cracks and crevices and old pruning cuts and, and down at the base of the tree and the burr knots and so on and so forth, and whether Warmer winters are, are are promoting the survivorship of those, which therefore get going maybe more early or earlier than the natural enemies kick in. And I will say that down this way, we not only have Aphelinus mali, but we also have several species of hoverflies that my data have shown are very important players in this guild of woolly apple aphid natural enemies. And in fact, as we have seen, and as Mark Brown showed um, a number of years ago, the hoverflies are actually more active in woolly apple aphid colonies than Aphelinus mali earlier in the season. Uh, and then Aphelinus tends to kick in once populations start to build, you know, uh, more so. I have sort of a question stepping back a couple feet. You know, BMSB, we kind of see, we get the peak, we get the crash, we have figured out mostly what management is going to look like in a lot of these regions. But I think we can all expect that there are going to be more invasives. And we're going to expect that when a new invasive pest comes through, people are going to hammer it hard. Do we think that there are preventative ways or proactive ways that we can start to give folks tools to say, these are the risks that you are taking with these invasives. Like, what is what is it about the early stages of invasive management that we might be able to address to maybe start to pull back on how many times an orchard is getting hit so hard with these insecticides over the decades? 
Mm. Yeah, I think, I, I, you know, when you, when you um, start considering invasive species, I, everything's basically off the table. I, you know, that it comes with the territory that people are going to be doing a lot of exploratory control methods that, that use, you know, harsher materials and more of them when something like a uh, uh, stink bug or a spotted lantern fly or something, come, th th these things uh, are just destined to upset, uh, upset the, the balance of what uh, uh, the, the natural enemies can do um, to, to help your, your pest management program. So that, that, that doesn't leave you very much room preventively um, you know, in, in terms of woolly, woolly apple aphid. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that there's anything that we can do to mm, sort of diminish the, you know, uh, the established populations within a, within an orchard. Um, I think some people, I don't, do some people you do some work on, um, uh, parasitic, uh, nematodes, entomopathogenic nematodes, um, that you know that would be if that was that would be a soil type application, and uh, if that was something that could be implemented to sort of uh, lower the the innate populations in an orchard, then it wouldn't be such a a tragedy, you know, such a, a, a drastic um, change or disruption to the system to have you know responses for invasive insects being implemented. Mm -hmm. But that, that's just thinking out loud, I don't know. It seems like maybe a part of that could be, you know, if we're deciding when it's worth it to apply Movento prophylactically, yeah. that's a part of our recommendations and learning when we do see new invasives come through is consider prophylactics more seriously. I've got a question for the group. On, on BMSB in, in particular, um, based on conversations that I had with Matt Grieship when he was at MSU, um, I got, like every other invasive pest on the planet, I seemed to bring them home from everybody's farms. Um, and I got hit, we, uh, my personal property was one of the earliest sites in Michigan. Um, and, about the same time I got hit with BMSB, I, I started to switch over to just on all of my fruit trees and, and vines, um, a 100% uh, a bio, a, a biological fungicide and bacteria program, which was based on actinovate and uh, now cease, but it used to be, um, I forget what, what the bacillus subtilis. Anyway, um, Matt was exploring an idea that the, since the fact that hemipterans poop all over their eggs to inoculate them with their gut biome, that that could potentially be disrupted. And I had two years of really, really bad BMSB loss. And when I started to go to seven day sprays of this biological, that entirely went away. And I'm wondering whether or not we just created a biome that wasn't, that did, wasn't conducive to them. Uh, um, being able to digest the juices that they suck. Okay. Anybody seen any any similar? Uh, and I that has worked for me for the last six years. I have on all of my crops. I have BMSB is everywhere around us. But uh, um, and I, I see other growers in the area still struggling with it. And I don't. Anybody anybody have again? I'm anecdotal. I'm really small. But. Anybody else seen any anybody have? activity that way or a similar response? No, I mean, that's right. you know, cutting edge stuff that I, it sounds fascinating, but I, I haven't heard of it before. No, I haven't either. I've seen a little bit of that research and I don't think it's super conclusive at this point. So I feel hesitant to, to kind of say much about it, but there there's certainly some indications that certain like, my, microbiome manipulations might disrupt some clades of hemipterans, depending. Well, I think, that's, I think, as I, far as it gets. I know you have Trisalcus japonicus up your way. We have it down here in 
spades, certainly in the area around where I am. I don't think that's going to be the be all and end all of brown marmorated stink bug control, but certainly it can only help, you know, to what extent it helps. I don't know what I will say that the growers here in Frederick County, Virginia, um, who have had massive issues with it in the past, really no longer consider it much of an issue and don't target it um, much, if at all. Or if they do, it's it's generally late season, toward the end of August, maybe into early September. Yeah, um, I'm wondering that. You know, with, with um, this Doug, uh, I was late arriving. Sorry, but the um, I was wondering if you know the, if once Trisulcus gets established, it, what it'll do is just make brown marmorid act more like our native stink bugs. You know, never always there, never going away, but just being held to lower levels. Hopefully, that's the hope. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, when in the years between when the Woolies broke out in 2000, 2001, and again in 2011 and on following BMSB, um, the growers were here in Virginia were in a, were in a very, um, I would say, progressive state of mind in terms of their pest management. In that they were adopting more widely mating disruption, uh, the so-called you know reduced risk or OP replacement insecticides had come online like Altacor and Delegate and and others and and their programs were effective at managing the, his, the you know the traditional key pests codling moth oriental fruit moth etc. They were costing the growers less and there were less there was less AI going on per acre than, than there had been historically. And so, and woolies were not an issue. So once BMSB kicked in and that whole thing, you know, and, and, and threw that huge monkey wrench into the, into the mix, then woolies became an issue again. So again, I, I suggest that if the natural enemies are including the aphelinus and including the hoverflies, which are the two groups in that guild that we have seen most mm. commonly here. I think, it, as I said, if left to their own devices, most of the time the growers won't have an issue with woolly apple aphid, unless there's some other sort of abiotic thing going on, like climate effects. That we can't really, we don't know, and would be difficult to get a handle on. Welcome Thank you. Um, I wish I'd show you those pictures because I have some things that you might like to see that are representative of uh, natural enemy activity on woolly colonies. Chris, after um, this session ends, if you wanted to send me a few slides that I could send out with the video, feel free to. Um, okay. You could maybe post them in the chat. I can't, I can't uh, see when I, when I try to share my screen, I get the Cornell screen. I don't get my desktop and this presentation is sitting on my mm. desk. Yeah. I think if you click the green button, this might work. Um, it should pull up a, you know, the option for you to select which screen you got. Do you have, do you have two monitors? Is that what's happening? No, I just have one monitor. So, um, Let's see. No, I can't. Uh... I think if you if you try launching the PowerPoint in the background, um, if you at least open it up when you try to hit the share screen button, it it might then give you the option to share the PowerPoint rather than what's you know that Cornell screen on your desktop. Well, even when I, yeah, even when I minimize the um, Zoom screen. It takes me to your Cornell screen. I, oh, I, can't, I can't see my um, my screen. Hmm. Well, yeah, I, mean, yeah I, I just tried to. I can see the Cornell screen, and I see my screen there. So you know, it's working on this end. Um. In the meantime, while we try to figure that 
out, I was wondering if we wanted to, we haven't touched at all on European Apple Softfly. So I was wondering if anybody wanted to add, you know, similar thoughts about that. Um, does that resonate? Can it, how, how similar do you think that those patterns of seeing test dynamics change, how much they overlap with Woolly Apple Aphid? Um, have we seen, yeah, uh, what, what kind of patterns have you seen there? Sorry, I would just ask uh, how how prevalent are, are these um, reports of new you know occurrences of European apple softfly in the region? I mean, we've we've always considered it to be something that uh, was more certainly common in maybe New England, certainly eastern New York, Hudson Valley uh, area, and, and the Champlain Valley. Uh, and occasionally, you know, we've been, we we had seen incursions into more western New York uh, areas, but to the extent that it has indeed been spreading, so-called spreading to some extent over the past 10 or 20 years, um, I think it's a completely different um, phenomenon to um, to what woolly apple aphid is. I, I think that's more climate related, climate change related, uh, because it's it's endemic, but it just has not uh, until you know recent years um, seemed to be able to exploit whatever conditions uh, would allow it to um, you know, be more of a, of a nuisance or more of a threat in uh, Western areas. Um, and I'm not saying it's just, I'm not saying it's just like a heat temperature type of thing, but I think they're just changes in patterns that, that have made it um, a little bit more um, successful in places where, in certainly Western New York, we had not seen it before, and I can't speculate mm -hmm. as to what those are. But yeah, we seem to be exporting them from central New England because we don't seem to have the issues with them anymore that we had, you know, twenty plus years ago. Um, I see them occasionally when I see a problem. It's because there's been, you know, no pre-blooming insecticide, um, no use of carbaryl at petal fall. And then use of something like a sail or, um, you know, Octara or um, Avant for the petal fall spray, which doesn't seem to have any impact on the the, the eggs that the soft flies have actually laid. It doesn't seem to kill the the eggs the way that the, or, the organophosphates and carbamates do or did. Um, and so the few times I've seen a bit of an outbreak of soft fly, it's been because of that um, pesticide pattern. Um, but we just don't, I mean, I still trap for them. I still put out those stupid white visual traps <laughs> that we've been using for, you know, multi-decades and, and just not really catching very much at all. But I hear people from Quebec say that they're seeing them. I think, yeah, Western New York, um, Pennsylvania, you know, I, I hear about them from other. I had a areas. question. I had a question about it yesterday at an orchard meeting in Amherst County, you know, <laughs> uh, but two, two hours east of here. You know, it's uh, and I asked you know where where it was. And, you know, the the it was actually the the injury was up in Nelson Albemarle area, and you know it's been reported there um, in low numbers just you know twenty years ago. You know, it, it doesn't seem to be moving very fast, so it's come down into the northern and central Piedmont, but doesn't seem to be going anywhere, and it, it never seems to be you know very severe. We certainly still see it frequently in eastern New York orchards and I'd say just like Kathleen was saying um yeah it seems to be worse in areas where we have really mixed varieties and at the same block and I think of the big part of that being you know one variety is hitting petal fall before the other especially now we have snapdragon where they seem to tend to hold their flowers yeah. um, I think it's the timing issue where you know some of them are just getting stung uh, while the others are still blooming so that, that seems to be where we see it the, the worst yeah, that's an excellent point, Mike. I, it, you know, in the old days when mono variety plantings were a lot, lot more popular, uh, just timing, you know, timing whatever uh, protective spray you had at petal fall um, and be sure you weren't late, basically, uh, would assure that, you know, you would pretty much take care of the, uh, the soft light problem. But now, you know, growers have 20 varieties uh, in, in a block, every three rows it changes. And um, I don't know, maybe they just wait for the last one to, to drop all the petals before they go in. And uh, you're, you're asking for some unusual things to start happening. 
Yeah, I can I can provide the similar stories from uh, Nova Scotia in Canada, um, where we do see we used to have pockets of of soft fly, but more recently those pockets have been been bigger, and growers who never had a problem with them are suddenly reporting um, many on their traps. And we're and I mean when I say many, we're into like fifty to hundred um, on site here at the uh, research center. It's not uncommon for us to get about three to five hundred on our traps over those couple of weeks when they're coming out but we're doing studies on them so that's that's kind of different we want them but um i think for our growers it's it's the um their window of opportunity is disappearing because we can hit pink and then the next thing they're into bloom and they barely are getting their pink sprays on which may or may not include a product for european soft fly before we're into bloom and they can't do anything and then soft fly is there so I think that for us has been contributing to their issues and where they see it and whether they get in at petal fall to do something is, is a crapshoot. Sometimes they might, sometimes they might not. And whether they're putting on, as Kathleen pointed out, uh, you know, a decent product to go after the egg, uh, also questionable. So that's what's happening up our way. Does anybody else see the little native soft flies that are like a little under a centimeter? In size, that's what I catch mostly on my white visual traps. I, and I, I have no idea whether they do anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I never, I never put those traps out because I tried it for a few years and I was just completely overwhelmed by all the junk that, that they caught. And I just didn't have the patience to go through and said, is this something that matters or is it just a fly or is it just, you know, a tarnished plant bug, whatever. So I, I don't know about the native soft flies. We certainly catch catch them here in Northern Virginia, um, but the the programs that we use are adequate are sufficient to keep the injury down to very very low levels. You know, we we always like to find some soft fly damage for our fall uh, extension meetings. You know, for the public and so on the the uh, Apple Harvest Festival and finding soft fly damage. Um, in the field for that purpose is typically very a very labor time intensive thing to do. The only time I ever really saw it here, it was twice. It was one orchard situation where they had some Macintosh trees and didn't want to spray those because I guess they weren't producing adequately or they just were getting out of the business of growing Macintosh. So they sprayed everything else and left the Macintosh and they were covered with soft light. And there was another instance down in Rappahannock County where it was supposedly they were, you know, trying to produce fruit organically and um, it didn't work. And so there were there were soft fly all riddling the fruit throughout that block. But so they're definitely here, but um, managed just as part of the general management program in most commercial orchards. My understanding is they're very susceptible to most insecticides. Are there other formerly uncommon pests that anybody is noticing? Patterns changing for any reason, known or unknown, you might want to throw into this conversation. Well, I might just throw in a plug for the last beast that I uh, concentrated on before I retired, black, uh, black stem borer. Um, and this is something that I, I think can be directly traced to different cultural practices, new cultural practices. Um, it's a tiny, tiny ambrosia beetle. Uh, it's been, you know, established in hardwood plantings uh, throughout the country for at least 70 or 80 years. but only recently have we started to had had we started to to start seeing um, uh, problems in um, uh, high density apple plantings, and the high density uh, uh, aspect of it is is a determinant. I think just because uh, the nature of this insect is that it's it's drawn, it's attracted to trees that are physiologically stressed, and uh, 
just the nature of modern, you know, apple horticulture and uh, and uh, the architecture and everything else um, uh, is is um, uh, probably responsible for trying to push uh, apple trees to their physiological limits, you know, to produce a, as much fruit as possible with as little foliage. And so the systems are increasingly fragile. Anything that, you know, kind of uh, t disturbs the system or disrupts it a bit, uh, throws them into uh, a bit of stress and uh, makes them targets for these uh, for these insects. And th the stressors are often abiotic, things like flooding or drought or extreme cold temperatures or w wacky winter weather, you know, things like that, or odd types of pruning regimens, all of which, you know, are very common in any, any commercial farm. So as a result, uh, you, get, you get these insects that um, uh, had been content previously to stick with their, you know, uh, sort of unmanaged hardwood hosts, you know, uh, uh, in, in the woodlots and things like that. And uh, they, they, they notice a susceptible host in these uh, very uh, fragile uh, system, uh, high density plantings uh, of uh, dwarf, semi-dwarf trees, um, you know, the small caliper trees that you only need one or two um, beetles to get inside into the heartwood to uh, send it, you know, uh, into a, a, de a death spiral. <laughs> so anyway, this is something that's cultural. And uh, the the things that you that you combat it with, uh, I mean, you know, I, I tested repellents and looked at host defense compounds and things like that, and and that that may prevent uh, some level of of uh, problems. But uh, it's basically a it's a, an information uh, problem. You you need to be aware of what it is that's going on in your trees, so that if there are uh, you know conditions that are ripe for promoting stress in your trees. This is among the, the, the uh, un unfavorable and destructive things that could happen to them. So I, it, not, not that you know, I'm pr promoting uh, people stop the, the way that they're training and, and pruning and, and uh, uh, packing the trees with fruits, because obviously this is, this is the, the, the modern, uh, the modern uh, approach. And uh, it's probably you know, the best way forward for most growers. It's just that you have to be more aware of these kinds of things uh, as having the, uh, the potential to, uh, uh, to, to cause a problem such as a previously unseen, whole, uh, unseen pro uh, insect problem. Uh, great addition. Uh, are there other, like the cultural practices have been changing so quickly, I have to wonder if there are other insect pests that come to mind similarly that kind of go with that trend. Uh, um, well, I mean, sort of in the same breath, along the same lines, just because now most trees are on uh, size controlling rootstocks, uh, they get, um, as a matter of course, uh, you know, burnouts, burnout expression, and um, uh, these these root initials that are attractive to dogwood borer. And dogwood borer used to be a relatively unknown pest. And just because of the modern way that that apple trees are grown now, uh, it's something that growers need to take into account in their pest management program. There, there's more and more of, an, uh, of a uh, likelihood that at some point in the life of their planting, dogwood borers are going to uh, find them and move in and pose a, a threat, a factor of, you know, sort of attrition to their trees. It doesn't may not kill them outright, but, you know, it's it's not going to do the, the plantings any good. And so they're just going to have to keep, put that on the list of things, you know, to, to include in their management program. Uh, look at um, uh, implementing um, mating disruption. Now we have good uh, DWB uh, uh, disruption, uh, pheromone ties and things that, that are quite good. Um, and, uh, you know, try to try to keep the root areas, the, sorry, the lower trunk areas clear uh, of weeds so that uh, predators like birds and other things can, can come in and uh, uh, maybe help 
you know, prevent big, big populations of these uh, dogwood borers from uh, getting established. So that's just, you know, uh, something that has come up over time in the past 20 years, never used to be a real problem, but trees were grown differently. Well, you know, the One thing I'll say about dogwood borer is that we, um, in our work here, we found that um, those plastic spiral wrap tree guards around the base of the tree, basically for rabbits and mice, I guess, and voles and so on, um, are, are very troublesome in terms of promoting those conditions of shade and high humidity that, that promote um, burnout growth. And that dogwood borer females can get in there. It's really uh, a preferred over position site, those burnouts. And it's when, as you know, Art indicated, they mine, they begin mining outward from the burnout into the vascular tissue that they can girdle the tree. So we, for a long time, have warned against the use of those spiral wrap tree guards for that very reason. Um, Another wrinkle on that is that um, on Gala, maybe some other varieties too, you know, the burnouts will run all the way up the trunk. You know, it's not just um, at the, the graft union. So, uh, and, you know, it seems like it's often where the uh, limb joins the trunk. And I often wondered, you know, what, the, what that did to the load bearing potential of the limb. You know, both from the burnout itself and then um, as it's in increased by the borer. Yeah, I think dogwood borer is mainly a pest in the early years of orchard establishment, right? Mm -hmm. and those, as Art was saying, the, the young caliper, the small caliper um, trunks and graft uh, scion and, and uh, rootstock are more vulnerable. You get an old established tree with some, with some girth on it, probably will support some level of dogwood borer with no adverse effects whatsoever. Agreed. And I would, I would just, I was just gonna um sort of corroborate what Art was saying and and back that up. That already since Laura's ban is no longer being used, um I've gotten a few calls in the last year from folks who have never seen dogwood borer before, and have it in their orchards now. So I do think that's something um worrying going forwards and you know I've been trying to plug the mating disruption but I think that one's tricky because if nobody if, if folks have not ever seen this pest before of course it's hard to encourage them to prophylactically use something fairly expensive and time consuming whereas at the same time um waiting until a population gets established is also not great so that's something that I've been trying to figure out from an extension standpoint what's the right recommendation um I know a sale is um a possibility, but I'm not sure sort of the efficacy between main disruption or a sale, what whether um, a sale is really a viable option or if that's just sort of like a okay second best. So wondering thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we we um, uh, um, did assays on, on uh, a number of things that you might spray in the trunks and a sale was probably among the best, but it's still kind of a second tier option, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, agreed. We found you needed two applications of a sale to get the same bang as one application of chlorpyrifos. Does painting the trunks help at all? And um, we had a really nice presentation the other week from Brett Blaw down at University of Georgia about entomopathogenic fungi for greater peach tree borer. Um, is that, are there any options? with the uh, dogwood borer? I think uh, um, David Shapiro Elon may have done some work on nematodes uh, against trunk borers. I'm not sure dogwood borer was one of them, but you know things like peach tree borer and things. And it can, that can work. Paint, painting using latex paint just flat out does not work. Uh, you know, I, if you if you included Lors band with it, then it was pretty good. But of course, we don't have that option anymore. And why why even bother with the paint? Uh, so yeah, paint just doesn't work. Um, but there are there are and could be some uh, other sort of more sustainable type approaches to um, pre preventing the uh, uh, the bore you know larvae from getting established. And I, I always was uh, we we tried some nematode sprays uh, using handgun and 
that didn't work so well, but probably because we were too rough on them. You know, a regular pesticide handgun is a pretty brutal thing to put uh, nematodes through. So, um, yeah, that was you know something something was interesting, but didn't we didn't develop it very far. Thanks, Art. I know he was saying it comes with a lot of caveats. You gotta kind of keep it moist or or something to to keep the nematodes alive. So I know he was saying there were a lot of a lot of qualifiers that went with it. So any any thoughts about some of the other beetle borers that we might come up with as we reduce our spray programs, the round-headed and flat-headed and God forbid preonus borer? Anybody <laughs> see those? Or <laughs> I'm going to quit if I ever see one of those. Yeah, well, I mean, roundheaded seems to be pretty reliably a pest, mainly in unmanaged plantings or very lightly managed. And I don't think most commercial orchards are going to be um, in that category. Flatheaded, basically, they're they're attracted to trees in decline. So if you've got flatheaded apple borers, you, you're you've got other problems. Um, that that are more primary and prionus borers. Um, I think mercifully those are geographically restricted to certain areas that you know are, are a little more sandy, like uh, you know Western Long Island and maybe along the shore of Rhode Island or something. I don't know. I, I I've only we we can find them in Western New York, uh, but they're um, they just don't seem to be a real big problem, which is a good thing because we're, they're... We're, always, we're always seeing them in, in uh, Central Virginia. Well, not Central Virginia. It was up on the Blue Ridge on, on mountain blocks. And I'm not sure why, you know, the, um, part, partly maybe, you know, the proximity of woods, maybe, you know, just, you know, you know shallow soils, you know, with, with, with some stress. But, you know, I, I, um, two growers that, you know, they each had um trees on the blue ridge and then trees down on the flat and you know the it was negligible down on the flat when when the trees were pulled the injury the channeling on the roots was negligible but up on the um up on the you know the ridge it, it was common but hmm. you know for for a while back in the you know late 80s early 90s i was getting complaints about it but you know no, none of the growers have talked about it lately yeah, I, I don't know. I think you're right. It's uh, it's some sort of a specific biome that they like. And um, happily, most commercial orchards don't, you know, possess that kind of those characteristics. So I, I wouldn't borrow trouble. <laughs> well, we have just a few more minutes left at this point so for an opportunity for any burning questions that didn't get brought up earlier in the discussion um or yeah anything related any further comment about the the delegate issue with woolly aphids i you know keep hearing about it but don't know really much about it it's very toxic to aphelinus and um, probably to the hoverflies as well, given that it's related to, what was it called, GS120? GS I think it was a, a fruit G fly bait. GF120, yeah. GF, yeah, GF120 yeah. was a fruit fly bait that was ba based on the similar AI, basically. Um, mm -hmm. So that was kind of predicted in advance of the release of Spinetoram. I remember we had meetings with Dow uh, you were probably there, Art. You you were probably there, Doug. I think some of them were associated with the Cumberland Chen Doa meeting, and and uh, yeah, lo and behold, in New Zealand, of course, was the first country to use it, being in the Southern Hemisphere, and um, the growers used it hard and hard and hot the first couple of years out for leaf rollers and codling moth predominantly. And they had woolly apple aphid in spades, and it caused them major problems for several years consecutively uh, by taking out the, the aphelinus mali. Um, yeah, and you know the, the hymenopter generally are susceptible to the spinosins, and so I was wondering if that was uh, part of the reason why we're getting more reports of scales on various crops. You know, white peach scale, San Jose scale, uh, right. rose, rose scale. 
Yeah, we we didn't get into that, but and in, in in the same uh, in, in the same uh, sense, we we've also been seeing more um, generations of some scales like San Jose scales, and uh, you know, it, it, maybe it's a climate warming type thing. But uh, yeah, that's that's probably also uh, part of the the uh, one of the contributing factors is things like spinosins. I always preferred, you know, in a season long program. Altacor, and now it's it's some of the other um, diamides like XRL and what have you. Against, for example, first and second, first or first generation coddling moth, because at that time you're not you're not as inclined to disrupt woolly biocontrol with something like delegate, and so holding delegate for the later generations of uh, coddling moth or oriental fruit moth. Um, and as well, Altacore is known to be much more rain fast than Delegate. And so at that time of the year, you know, in May and sort of late May into the middle part of June, you tend to have more rain maybe than you do later on in the season in a typical year, whatever that is anymore. But and so for those two reasons, um, our recommendation was Altacore first and then Delegate later. Yeah. I would corroborate that as the the accepted approach in uh, in uh, Western New York. Most most of New York people who were using a, a delegate Eltacor uh, program for their internal worms is to save the delegate for as long for as late in the season as possible, just for that reason. Yeah, that's that's very helpful. I, I usually just tell people whichever you know, be sure to rotate them, but not particular about the order that they get used in. This pl planazoline coming from Syngenta looks very promising as a new rotational tool for LEPs, for sure. And it's got a broader spectrum of activity than just LEP larvae. So hopefully that'll be online within the next year or two. Is that a new class? It is. Yes, it is. Interesting. What was it called? Uh, its common chemical name is planazoline. It's very, it's excellent against lep, uh, lep larvae. Well, we're just about at time now. So thank you all for your thoughts, wisdom, questions, and time. Yeah, thank you for the uh, invitation to, uh, yes. to join today. It's great to see some familiar faces, old friends, uh, and Sue, especially from uh, Nova Scotia, nice to see you again. It's been so many years. <laughs> Thanks. Good to see you, George. <laughs> yeah, same thing that Art said. Have a great day, everybody. You're here. You too. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. Bye now.